Hey guys, it's Ryan, your host here, and welcome to the Two Albums Podcast. Each week we choose two albums that we think are underrated and we compliment, insult, and critique the album the other has chosen. Thank you for downloading this new podcast hosted by myself and my friend Nick. Unfortunately, we've had to record over Skype due to new local COVID regulations in the UK. You can find us on Instagram at twoalbums.pod and on Twitter at twoalbumspod. That's two, number two. Thanks for tuning in and we hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome back to the second episode of Two Albums Podcast. There's been a name change and I'm sure you've seen that on the video version in the edits. And I mentioned it at the start on a voiceover at the start of the first episode. So this is just an album, uh, a podcast, should I say, where we choose two albums and they're meant to be underrated albums that we, well, albums we feel are underrated because some of the albums we choose are going to be quite popular, um, even if it's just for one or two tracks. And we discuss them at length, track by track, and we either slate them or talk about how much we love them. So last episode, we did The Cure, uh, Japanese Whispers, and uh, we did Adam and the Ants, Prince Charming. And we both had very good things to say about both of those albums, didn't we, Nick? We did. Does this so, mean you've got bad things to say about the album I suggested? Oh, we, we will get into this today, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is, uh, this is my co-host, Nick Scott. I am Hi. the host, Ryan Underwood, and we'll get on, shall we, Nick? Right, so, have you got a coin? Yeah. I've got a coin. Right. So, I, I, right, so, you pick this week. Actually, I'll flip a coin, because I can't see if you've done it right or not. So, whoever wins the coin, Toss, gets to Ryan go just to their album. Straight up not trusting me. We've known each other <laughs> five years. Five and... years. <laughs> right, Nick. Ah, dropped it. There we go. Right, heads or tails? Uh, heads. You go first. Me first. Okay. First. Nick, so, so what album have you brought me to, well, this week, not today? Well, this week, the album I chose. The people who love this album think that their girlfriend is better and would burn the house down if it's not played at the party. Spotify describes the band as an example of art school rock. And if there's such a thing as art school rockers, this would definitely be an essential listen for them. Start to dress a certain way, and people assume you have this on vinyl. I am, of course, talking about Speaking in Tongues by Talking Heads. Although this album is by no means underrated by the fans, in my opinion, it never has an album been so revered and so guarded at the same time. Soon to hit a big resurgence in the indie scene, it is a band that has never been is as much in the limelight as it deserves. And this album has such a creative use of sound that hasn't seemed to have stuck around. So, yeah. So, Speaking Nick... in tongues <laughs> by Talking Heads. Before we go into this podcast, I, um, I didn't click record as we were talking about what we're drinking this week. So would, would you like to say what you're drinking this week? Well, <laughs> <laughs> in, in spirit of of talking head fans and people who love these months so they can wear their long coats and drink black coffee from the art campus. Um, I'm drinking the Sainsbury's house Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> <laughs> it's blurred out to shit. That's good. <laughs> I am, I am drinking the most, I'm doing my A levels or GCSEs and don't want to get caught with alcohol. I'm drinking a red leg with lemonade in a McDonald's cup. <laughs> To be fair, I think that kind of goes with the album you chose as well. <laughs> it really, really does. <laughs> we yeah. should try and do this every week. We should try and max drinks to the albums. <laughs> that would be class. No, because I'd go for like, if I did something like the album Bleach, then there's not really much I can choose to bring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just walk in with a fucking bottle of Duck. <laughs> Just pour it into me. Oh, this man. week, I'm drinking Domestos. <laughs> <laughs> right, Nick, so what is the first track on this album? First track on this album, Burning Down the House. Right, 
is probably the most famous track on the album. It's a very short album. Um, but yeah, this is Burning Down a House. And what did you think of it, Ryan? So, like I said on the end of um, last week's podcast, if if it got into the podcast, I can't remember on the edit. Um, I've only heard the song once before, and it was the Tom Jones cover. Uh, <laughs> I, I do, I do love this song. This is a song that I didn't even know was by Talking Heads, and I've heard it millions of times. But it was I just by really, Tom really like the song. Yeah, I heard the Tom Jones one first. But I think that says more about my upbringing than my music taste, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I'll, I, to be fair, I think Talking Heads is um, is a really it's a really they're quite a strange band. Not in the sense that they've got a strange sound, which although they do, it's a sense of their sound is so varied that it's hard to like pin them down to something. Yeah, and like if, if you were to put a genre to this, you couldn't really do it other than maybe say like alt rock. But then yeah. it's probably more funk than alt rock. Then it's not quite funk. Yeah, I think this this song, I, well, this band in general have been struggling to think of what it sounds like. There is really nothing like it. I was I was talking to my manager in work about the album you gave me, and he was like, I can't remember the name of the lead singer, but he was like, he is a mad one him, he's just he weird. Is mad. And I was like, I've heard he that he's dead weird. weird. But you I, I wanna? Think... They did a film, not like a film, but like like yeah, like a film of a gig. Um, it's called Stop Making Sense, and yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's very <laughs> weird. But <laughs> the first, like the first. I want to say like seven minutes of the film is is just him with a boombox on the stage in a suit that doesn't fit him and an acoustic guitar playing Psycho Killer and oh, like God. the beatbox is the the boombox is like doing like this metronome sort of version like a really tinny version of the bass line and drum beat as yeah. he's just there with a acoustic guitar but <laughs> it is a really good cover of the track. It, it's I think this is um. It is definitely one of my favourites from the album. But as an album as a whole, Nick, I've got to say, I'm not a fan. I didn't think you would be. I'm not I a mean, Talking Heads fan. Yeah. I didn't... Yeah, I mean, I thought... I was kind of suggesting this song where I was like, like, Ryan does need to listen to Talking Heads at some point. I think everyone, everyone who claims to be a music fan or someone who is interested in music, they need to listen to Talking Heads. Just like someone who claims to be interested in film, as much as it's not like my favourite film, they need to watch, you know, Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Or, you know. Vertigo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah like, I wouldn't, I, did, I don't really listen to Talking Heads regularly and I do like a few of the tracks on this album. Yeah. But, to yeah. me, to me, as a, as an I like like I like a lot of different types of music. Um, but to me this album felt very samey throughout a lot of the songs. I was just kinda like there's not a lot of variation to me. Like I couldn't tell. Uh, as this might be heresy to a lot of art students, but I couldn't tell when a song changed because I've got my Spotify set to fade. So the songs fade in and out. And so I was listening to this. I've got my Spotify like, set to fade. <laughs> but I was genuinely just like, like it, fa- it fades the last five seconds and the first five seconds of a song unless I skip it. Um, and to me, like I was listening to it on like when I went for walks and stuff, and I was just like, man, this, this is this the same song? And I had to keep looking down at my phone and being like, oh my god, it's a different song. And I feel I feel really bad because I know that loads of people absolutely adore this band. They're just not my thing. I think that's fair enough. I think, I think, and I was saying, I don't know if it was on, it's on the podcast from last week, but I think, in my opinion, it's it's a band that a lot of people claim to have listened to, and I'm not saying they haven't listened to it. I'm not saying they're straight up blind, but I don't think they've ever gone to like sit down and fully listen to an album. No. And I I I agree. There are some songs on the Talking Heads discography which really do stand out. Like Ben and the House, Psycho Killer, Izimba, um, mm. and then it is a it is a band that does have a lot of filler. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Nick. What yeah. what is the next song? 
The next song, I believe, Making Flippy Floppy. Yes, it is. Everybody. Get in line. Nothing can come between us. Nothing gets you down. Nothing strikes your fancy. Nothing turns you on. Somebody is waiting in the hallway. Somebody is falling down. I really like this track. Do you know what? This this did stand out to me. But I was kind of like, it just, like, after a while of this, what is the runtime of this song? Right, so it's six minutes. About six minutes. And it's <laughs> extremely the same the whole way through. And I was like, about, after about three minutes of this, I was like, does this change? No, it doesn't. Okay. That's just my opinion on it, though. I like this. I mean. <sighs> Tell me why it's good, Nick. Try and fight me over this shit. <laughs> I, I, it's just. Got a bit of like a, a bit of like a beat to it. <laughs> but any of the I, but any of the people who, who just get this on audio, they won't they won't they have see the head wobble. My, oh. my visual argumentation, I like this track. But it's just you listen to it and you just want to sort of like wobble your head a bit. <laughs> you know I I think, to me, this sounds like the sort of music that um Patrick Bateman would kill someone to. <sighs> It's very Huey Lewis in the news. It's hip to be square. I like, I like, that. <laughs> I like that analogy as well. <laughs> yeah. It's the only I thing like... I could think of it being, it, it was like, this is either Back to the Future or it's Huey Lewis in the news, hip to be square moment where he just yeah. kills Jared Leto. That's, that's, yeah, that's all I can say about this song, man. I, I understand like that, that people love it, but it's, again... I also... I like the idea that out there somewhere there, <laughs> there's like an alternative take of uh, American Psycho where Patrick Bateman's saying <laughs> some people like their earlier punk years. <laughs> However, I believe that speaking in tongues is a real excellent use of punk and synthetic sounds. <laughs> and then he just pulls out a fucking axe and just kills the dude. Man, Any movie where Jared Leto gets murdered or beaten up, that's what I want to watch. Yeah, same. Yeah. I agree. So should we move on to the next track, Nick? Yeah, I feel like <laughs> we're, we're too opposed on this one to yeah. make any reasonable <laughs> conversation. <laughs> right, Apart next from song. me just wobbling my head every now and then. <laughs> Girlfriend is better. Okay. What did you think of this song? Um, I felt like this was a bit more of a mellower song to the first two. I feel like it's a bit more of um, I feel like this band are very jazzy, not in the way that they sound, but in the way that they work. Uh, again, yeah. experimental. And like I said, I love experimental music. Um, this song hit a bit better for me than the last one did. And I was like, I can kind of listen to this. There's enough of a of an ambiance about it. There's enough of, it feels like a spacey song. Um, mm. But again, it's it's not something I'd listen to day to day. It's no. I, it's not something I'd put on a playlist. This would have to be something where I was skipping through a random playlist, downloading, and oh, I remember this song. And I'm just yeah. listening to it then. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, <clears throat> the thing, I think this is, this is a good track. Um, and I think, it, yeah, like you're saying, like Talking Heads does kind of have that jazzy feel to it. It isn't, it isn't as rigid in its structure. It does a lot of the tracks do prefer to. I hate to use this phrase, but prefer to make more sort of a soundscape, yeah. rather than sort of like a structure of like rhythm guitar, lead guitar, drums and bass. Yeah. And I think this is this is a really good example where Talking Heads uses this approach to music really well i think like all the sounds in it they do add to what the track is there's a lot of there's a lot going on this in track a lot of like 
the synthetic sound and the little like twiddly bits and stuff which I think really just adds to it not necessarily like make it any more catchy but yeah. just just sort of like again like another bit of like a head wobbly one I did enjoy um the guitar in this song though I do like how it's very um it's very clean but it's also very trebly like you can kind of feel every note that because it's like it's obviously they're influenced by funk and that really does come through on this track with the guitar it sounds like something that the red hot chili peppers would put into one of their songs the guitar on this track yeah it's definitely got like that that kind of like um from something like chic or something like that like that very glassy sort of guitar tone very clear but it's not it's not sort of used in a similar way it is used in more like the odd like little riff i don't know if you ever if you ever did any sort of like reading around talking heads but do you want to know um when their first like main gig was go on they were supporting a band can you guess which band they supported ryan um you're gonna have to give me like a region of the time scale for that we're talking like i think like 80s 90s sort of time period. or maybe uh, late 70s early 80s i'm thinking oh i was gonna say rem but i don't know if they were around that then you won't you won't get it okay go on who was it so it was in a underground punk club in new york called pbgb so or h hbgb yeah was it cbgbs c sorry cbgbs yeah we love dyslexia and they were supporting the ramones that's so weird because um the band that i've chosen were quite famous in the 80s for playing cbgbs um and i I think it's very weird music scene we've accidentally chosen bands from the same scene but were very different sounds yeah right nick so what's the next track on this album next track is slippery people So this track, Nick, what can you tell me about this? It's a bit more sort of... I'm just going to have to listen to it a bit more. <laughs> it's a bit more of an example of like, um, you know, Talking Heads making sort of a slightly different approach to music. Like, not much structure again. A lot of it is more of a soundscape. And uh, David Burns, I think it's the front man, weird lyrics you know and strange sort of approach to writing music what did you think of this track this track again to me i i found this one pretty dull i was just kind of like okay i'm just like i'm not a big fan of synthetic music at the best of times i'm i'm more of a believer of i i want to listen to bands who i'd want to see live you know what i mean like i i want something with a bit more of a wow factor and to me the harmonies and the way that the back and vocals came in was the best thing about this song. Mm. I didn't really like the song. I, it's got a really good hook, but I yeah. think that's kind of because the harmonies that come in after enforce it a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, again, it, I feel like every band has tracks that are not sort of necessarily there to please everyone or just normal listeners, but they definitely have tracks that they know will have a wider appeal and then tracks that won't. I think this is a Talking Heads track that is very much a Talking Heads track. It yeah. is a little bit weird, uh, not quite as structured. It, I, I agree with you, it doesn't have that kind of performance, you know, sort of thing, and it doesn't have, like, a sort of dancey sort of vibe to, like, bend down the house or a cliffy floppy house. If I was in a record label and they brought me this song and was like we want to make this a single would you help us produce this and be like no <laughs> really sorry no it's, it's not special yeah. about it. it there's no um it's there's definitely no... not yeah it's definitely not a single i think and i think if i'm correct there's no that is kind of like you know the rest of the vibe for the album really which is a, a bit disappointing yeah but 
Should we move on to the next track? We shall. What is the next track, Nick? It's I Get Wild slash Wild Gravity. Okay, so the runtime of this one is six minutes, which is exactly the same runtime as one song they had, but this is two in one. Hmm. Yeah. I think so. The, the first part of it, it again, like, I don't really know how much more there really is to say on it, uh, you know, other than a lot of this album is just sort of like, it is different. It is different to what was going on at the time it it is a more sort of like a spaced out approach to how to make music like yeah you've got the drums going all the time but you haven't got drums and a riff going on all the time yeah and i think it's more sort of an example of as i said earlier creating like a soundscape and maybe yeah. that does lend towards like background music but I so what did you it... think about I, do you know when i i like I like the little sample of that in the background. I really like that. Again, the harmonies are good. I really like that. But to me, this was the epitome of, yeah, I can see why art students masturbate over this band. It is something that they would really, really, really like. It's that to me, this is something that they go, like, they take acid and then do a painting while listening to this band and this song in particular and be like, it's the best thing I've ever made. And I'd be like, that song's just mundane though. How and that art piece looks like like shite. Why would you I don't get this? I just don't get it. Like as someone mm. who is an artist, but not in the same way that I'm a physical artist. I write and that's all I do for art, really. I write and play, and that's about it. And film at the odd thing. Like, so my all my art is kind of is not very like visual apart from the film aspect and even mm. then i focus more on the writing so i feel like maybe the sort of person who likes this music is just not me as an artist i do agree like you can kind of become sort of torn between sort of two moods with this type of music it's like do you do you like the fact that it's you know because it is a bit different and mm. it is you know bit sort of odd and like some people will like that and some yeah. people won't but yeah I think, I think I think that's perfectly I'm not gonna I can't, I can't really disagree with you I can't, I can't really say well, you're wrong for not liking it as much as some people who listen to this album probably would want to say that oh I was fully I expecting like, you to come at me for this for this no uh, because section. at the end of the day I, I, I kind of I kind of agree with you with like in a lot of senses but I just I like the sound. I, I think that I can't really I can't really say any more on it. Other than <laughs> you just like I it. like everything you don't like about this album. But then it, that that's fine. Like you said, like it's different, and I like different. It's just not the different I'm looking for. It's not yeah. my different. My mm. different is usually more of a an aggressive or a political different, or it's more of a a darker, more disturbing different. And yeah, this is. But to me the poppiness of it is just something I can't get to grips to. And the spaciness of it, as weird as that is as an adjective to describe this, the spaciness is not good for, I don't like it. I don't like the use of it in this particular record or this particular song. But, you know, if I get why people do. It's just not for me. Fair enough. I think... Yeah. The thing, the thing I do like about Talking Heads is, whereas some people, some musicians and artists, they will do something different, and then they are considered sort of like pioneers. So the Beatles are an amazing example on so many different approaches to music, mm -hmm. like the way um, Sgt. Pepper's was recorded. Yeah, different kind of use of sounds, and you can hear it in this album, and any Tame and Parlor track, and almost any kind of piece of music that came out afterwards 
you know, that was something that was different and then birthed so many other things. I feel like this was different. It, it took in, it was a very postmodern approach to music. It was taking, you know, sounds that you can't really pinpoint where they come from. You can't really pinpoint the sounds in there. Everything's much more sort of like referential to everything else that is around it. It's much more uh, this use of like international sounds. And I feel like it is different. And I feel the thing I like about it is it is still different. No one else has really done anything like this since. No. Whereas some albums have been different and then people have gotten with it. Yeah, I do. I do see like that this is a very specific band. There is nothing really I can point it to other than it does sound like a different variation of what bands like The Cure did again. It, it's it's similar to it, but it's not the same. This feels like an American take on the what Britain were doing after punk. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I agree with you. And I was thinking this it is a very good example of American post punk. Uh, I think it's a very good way of looking at how the New York scene and the American scene was different to the to the London or the Manchester or Liverpool scene that was going on. Yeah. Um, and obviously, <laughs> so much of the Manchester scene has stuck around with. Things like, you know, New Order and the Smiths yeah, and stuff like that. And I think this hasn't stuck around. And I feel if maybe music had gone in this direction, people would look at this album differently. I think, yeah. in my opinion, Talking Heads has as much musical merit as, you know, uh, the, pi- the, the, the sounds that um, came from a similar era that did pioneer. Yeah. Um, like as I said on my intro, I don't think it's an underrated album from anyone who's listened to it by no means, but I think more people should listen to it. Even if they don't it like is it. Yeah. 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 It is something that you should try and sort of like break your taste with. I feel like you know, people people there's like stupid sayings like, Oh, you should do something that you dis- not necessarily disagree with, but like you should push your boundaries. And yeah. I feel like this album is a good way of like it's a good way of looking at post punk. But yeah, let's move on to the next track, which what is, is Swamp. The next track? Swamp. Yeah. Let's go. So this track, for me, I felt like I really liked the talking at the start on the, like, the music. I'm a big fan of that in music, and I don't know why. It's just a little mm-hmm. quirk of recording somewhere. I'm like, oh, I love that they kept that in. Like, there's a couple mm-hmm. of Nirvana songs that I like B-sides, where like at the start of the song, it'll just be like Dave shouting something fucking stupid behind a drum kit, and then they'll be yeah. them laughing, and then it'll go into it. And I, I like that. But I feel like this is more embedded in the song. And I think, it, yeah, it's I think he again. Quirk is um, quirk is like a really good way of talking about the way Talking Heads make music. I think it is quirky, and I think a lot of, you know, quirks that would have been maybe shaved off are kept in the tracks. The the singing style in this song. Which, as we were talking about before we started recording, in excess, it reminds me of Michael Hutchins. Yeah. It reminds me of a little bit of a of a Mr. Fye tone. Mm. And um I like like I like this hook. I think it's really clever that it's literally just like nonsensical, but it like it it's kinda catchy. And I I, I, I this is a song I can groove to and be like, yeah, I could just listen to this. But to me, it's- like I, I, whenever I listen to this sort of music, it instantly reminds me of films from the 80s. And I can sort of see, yeah. do you remember the scene in Len where he's like preparing all the drugs in his room? I can yeah. see that in colour happening to this with like a taxi driver aesthetic going on. Yeah, to be fair, like 
if you if you were to try and this is such a punty way to talk about this album, but if you don't know, La N is a French film set in the housing estates of Paris about just about three teenagers really and just what they do in their in their daily life. Um and I feel like a New York La N is a very good way to those who know those that specific reference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's, it's is like a good way of looking at this album and talking heads. And uh, do you know what I I did notice is because I've been I've been rewatching um hang on. Is that relentless, Ryan? <laughs> it's a it's a monster, yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll let you off then. Thank you. I've um I was watching uh, Misfits and I didn't yes. realize that yes. uh, that the guy who plays Ramsey uh, he listens mm. to a lot of talking heads. He also Love really them. likes well. Echo and the Bunny Men, which are another yeah. sort of, to me, like Echo and the Bunny Men are probably one of the only successful Liverpool bands that came out of Liverpool during like the after punk movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and their sound is completely different to Manchester and completely different to London and completely different to New York. But New York, in particular, to me, is completely different to all of them in the same way that Echo and the Bunny Men is. And I got yeah. that from this song. But to me, the Manchester and the London scene at the time were very, very similar. Yeah. Um, but then, obviously, you, as you moved on a little bit and got more into the 90s, it, the Manchester and the London scene differed because you had the Oasis and the Stone Roses versus the Blairs and the Common People and the Pulps and all that. Yeah. Um, but this is this track made me think of the yeah, LN. I was just like, yeah, this is Taxi Driver Land, this. It's another, it's another <laughs> one. It's just sort of like, um, I mean, very, very different albums to last week. Last week's albums, they were very much like, particularly Prince Charming um, by Adam and the Ants is, a, is an example of like storytelling for your music. And I don't feel this is at all. This album is really, it's really about making noises as stupid as that sounds yeah you know, about music but it really is about making noises and what you can do with these sort of noises but also the people that do listen to talking heads i think should really to think about what is this album doing how it does because you got to think when it came out synthesize so <sighs> synthesizers technically sort of started in like the 60s led zeppelin technically were using synthesizers they were using like um keys that would trigger tape like um cassette tapes that played sounds but then once you once you get into the 80s and the and the 90s you see much more of like um like corgs and catios much more of electronic sounds so um a great example is blue monday by new yeah. order that's got, um, I think it uses an 808, or it probably uses the predecessor to the 808, which is the most famous drum machine. Um, this is how much of a fucking nerd I is am. That the one, is that the one that's like, duh, 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 duh. yeah. Yeah, and it, I think, like, Talking Heads is a really great example where artists were starting to, like, push buttons to make noise rather than... And I know you hate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... yeah, I really do. But I can I can appreciate it. Like I, the Cure did it, but um, in some of their songs. But mm-hmm. I can still appreciate it when it's done right. I just don't think it should be the emphasis. But I don't I don't I don't want to. Bands can do what they want. Like I I thought hip hop was lazy for quite a long time until I actually got into it. Because I was like, oh, they're just like the writing's the cool bit, but they just like sample everything. You can sample things in a clever way, but with synths, to me. It is an instrument, and I don't want to say it's not, but to me, it doesn't feel pure. Like, not it doesn't feel pure. It feels a bit fake. But it, and some bands use it really well. I'm not saying I think I, I'm, I can be wrong. It's just my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, more people, more people who are proper like against electronic music need, need to be like that. Yeah, <laughs> but it can be wrong, and it is just opinion because in the, the day, a lot of it is down to personal taste. And yeah. the thing, the thing I do like about this album is that some of the sounds are a bit plasticky, are a bit fake. Yeah. Like the 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 drum sounds, they do, they do. I don't want to say overproduced. Sound like a little thinner and a little bit more 
yeah, a bit fake, fake, but I like that. I think it's but cool. It, it, as you just said before, more, more. You know, I'm from us talking just in general that I'm not a big fan of electronic music. I'm not a big fan of like dance music. I'm not a big EDM fan at the moment. I really hate most pop tunes that are coming out. I think they're really bad. I just think they're lazy. But I'm not against it. Like it's just my opinion. I'm. Oh, I've always been more into. The, the effort that people put in behind the music. And when I look at that, I think like sitting over a piano or a guitar or a bass or sitting over a classic, not a classical, but a classic instrument for ages to write it. And then to me, some to things that you're putting out, like as you're, as you're going through the recording process and experimenting. And um, they're not like, I wouldn't be opposed to using one in a song that I wrote, but I would never go, oh, I really need this in a song. I go, yeah, let's try it with that. And if it doesn't work, we're, like, we're, never, we're not using that. Well, maybe for another track when it fits, but it doesn't fit. Um, and that's the thing that synths fit their sound with the music I tend to like. And as I've just said, I'm not a big Talking Heads fan. With the music I tend to like, synths don't fit, synths don't fit the sound. Nick, what is the next tune? The next tune is Moon Rocks. I like this one. Yeah? Yeah. I, it, to I like me, again, bit of a scar feeling. Yeah. It has, as I was saying, like, it has... Talking Heads, it really cherry-picks a lot of sounds. It really does, you know, like a magpie take up lots of different stuff. Yeah. Like, this has got this, like, scar, reggae sort of vibe. And if you listen to some of their other tracks, like um, Izimba really great example it's got some like like almost like an afro beat sort of vibe you know like yeah. quite percussion 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 driven and then Izimba became the basis of their most famous song which is the one i think it's called what's it called <laughs> not psycho killer so... psycho killer is their most famous song no i would disagree okay me Okay, no, Psycho Killer, according to Spotify, is the most famous Definitely, song. yeah. But Once in a Lifetime, this uh, one that's like, same as it ever was. Yeah. That also has, I think same as it ever was, is the epitome of everything Talking yeah. Heads is. I think Psycho Killer is a really, for me, Psycho Killer represents, it is a punk track or a post-punk track in a much more obvious sense. Yeah. It I is... think with Psycho Killer though, it obviously is it's it's a dirty rock song, but it's it's also cleaner than a lot of dirty rock songs. But it's dirty mm-hmm. in regards to their discography. Yeah, yeah, and I think like when that first album came out, it was they were trying to do pretentious punk almost, yeah. or like punk for art school rockers, as I said. Yeah. yeah. I, I, the, what I like about this song is the vocals are different in this completely. Well, not completely because it's obviously still his voice, but they're they're very they are different because you've got the radio sort of voice going on a little bit, and then you can hear the doubled up vocals. But this is a high, he's singing it higher than he usually sings, and mm. that's kind of why I like this one a bit more. Is because to me, it it I can see I can hear the song and go, oh wait, I know who's copied this sort of voice. Like, yeah. again, in excess comes to mind with the voice. And I like that. I'm, like, I, I think this band's a good band. Like I said, just not my cup of tea. But this song a, is a good bop. Love it. Have you looked at any pictures of the front man? Nope. I feel like, I feel like now is the time. I'm going to try and find a good one. And I will share my screen with you. Yeah, I was going to say, you've got the share I feel screen. Like once you, yeah, once you... Once you see him, everything will make sense. <laughs> Love it. This is from... Okay. 
this is from the uh, the film I was talking about. Stop making sense. Yeah. Is it, is it working? It's working. The Skype screen's in the yeah. way at the moment. There's just a big... There we go. Oh, God. Yeah, that makes sense. This, he is, kind oh, of, this is a good one. He kind of reminds me of Morrissey, if I'm being honest, though, man. He, he is. He is kind of like an American Morrissey, as much as I fucking hate Morrissey. Same. Um, he does. He does kind of have that kind of energy as much as Morrissey is. Have I told you about the time that we kicked out a dude in our pub because he wanted Morrissey on? I feel like you have, but <laughs> I want to hear the story again. So we were in um we were in Dr. Duncan's where I used to work and it was me and my old colleague Chris who I'm still I'm still mates with now. And um we, we spent all afternoon deleting all Oasis and Gallagher songs and all um okay. And all of Morrissey's music off of the playlist. And we missed one song. We were stood there and it came on. And Chris darted over the bar and skipped it. And the guy in front of us was like, what are you doing? And I was like, what do you mean? What am I doing? And he was like, why did you skip that song? And I was like, because I fucking hate Morrissey. And Chris was like, and I hate Morrissey. So he skipped it. And he was like, Morrissey's a legend. You need to put that back on now. And I was like, no. And he was like, do it. And I was like. No, <laughs> if you want the song back on, ask politely. Don't have a go at me. And Chris was like, "Why are you? This is exactly why we don't want Morrissey on because this is what people who listen to Morrissey act like." And, <laughs> and he was like, "How? Oh, how dare? You? How dare? You? I was having a proper go at us." And he finished his drink and he came over to order another drink and just went, "No," <laughs> and he was like, "What?" And I was like. I'm not serving you. He went, why not? I went, because you talk to me like I'm talking to you right now. And Chris was like, yeah, fuck off, Morrissey lover. And we were just like, yeah, okay. And he just left the pub. <laughs> you should have said to him, um, there's a club if you'd like to go. You could meet somebody who might serve you. <laughs> I don't know if that's a Morrissey song. Is it? Is it a Morrissey song? It, it's a Smith lyric from oh. the song How Soon Is Now. Anyway, Nick, what is the next track on this? On that's that's not the name of the album. That's the name of my phone. What is the next track? The next track is "Pull Up the Roots." Can you hear that? I hear it. Sound. Right, Nick. Pulling on the roots. Again, it's another... I mean... I think this album is quite samey. Um, yeah. And, but I still think each track manages to use the attitude to the sound really well. Not every track isn't wildly different from the last one. And maybe it's a little bit too similar. But I still think this is another... Just good example of, you know, the use of sounds and yeah. the general attitude that talking heads were taking to making music at this period of time. And I like it because I feel like this one, it has got more of the beat again. It, the beat is more involved, which we kind of lost in a few of the other tracks. It does yeah. kind of return to, it sounds very similar to Girlfriend is Better. Yeah. I think, but, yeah. again, the harmony is my favorite part of this song on the guitar. Um, I do like, Cause I'm listening to the I'm listening to this because I I never have my um headphones off of stereo. I can hear the guitar in this headphone and it's different to the one in this headphone. And um, I like that. I like when they're mixed and they've done that for a reason. Because a lot of people just go, well, I just put it in both. And I'm like, no, no, because if you've got two different things going on, people are more aware of what's happening. And it also like it gives it a bit more texture. And I think this is what this song has. Although I don't like the song. I've got to admit, it's got more texture than a couple of the other tracks. It is, it is, it is making, mm, it's making music, but it is, it's definitely making noises than it is more making a track or a song or like a, a melody or something. I think like a lot of people really get bogged down in looking for a structure in songs, particularly when they're writing songs. And I think like in 
in some ways, that's what's so great about punk because it's so obviously homegrown and then something you can do in your bedroom. I feel like that's what me and you both admire about punk. It is, you know, it, you're almost an equal to the person playing it on stage. And that was kind of the point of it. The yeah. Point of punk was to engage the people, you know, listening to it. Maybe yeah. to write their own or, you know, get out on the streets and complain about stuff. Well, I think... I feel like this different this is more sort of like we are in the studio we have got this ability to make something really weird yeah i think if it wasn't for the punk scene and what it's grown out of this sort of music and if it wasn't for the way that this sort of music has evolved the music that we listen to we would never have tried to start our own band because even the Beatles were like, well, nobody started their own band back then, really, because it was seen as if you weren't talented enough, you shouldn't do it. You had to be really, really good to want to have been in a band, and that's the only reason the music would have got made. But there's there's something about a charm about this album because it does feel like there's a whole do-it-yourself attitude, and that's what makes it cool. It does feel like... They do feel like the sort of band where if you go, well, if you don't like us, just don't listen to us. And that's exactly yeah. how I feel about a lot of music. I'm like, if you just don't like it, don't listen to it. Just put it down. <laughs> <They're> definitely... <laughs> just put it down, lads. Don't listen to me if you don't want to listen to me. <laughs> that's exactly how I feel, though. Um, <laughs> it, no, I agree. It is definitely like they've not... I don't feel as if it's been made with anyone in mind particularly. And I, yeah, I like that. Yeah. So, Nick, what is the next track on this record? The next track is uh, This Must Be The Place. <clears throat> it says Naive Melody. I don't know why it says that. I think yeah. I think there's a lot of like different kind of takes, different tracks. Um, I want to say this is actually the closing track of the album, because I think the other there's ones are just more. sort of... There's two notes swivel and then an, an alternative take of Burn Down the House, which we'll just 